colonized and used as a backup planet, that would be far enough into the future that the people who are in this movement now would not be alive by the time it happens. I think some of them certainly would, would hope that they will be around for it. I think, you know, Elon Musk, for instance, uh, who is kind of the major advocate of Mars colonization at this point, I think, um, I think he's pretty explicit about the fact that he wants personally to get to Mars. Um, so, you know, these are optimistic people and, uh, you know, a lot of them do believe that they will get to Mars, or at least humans will get to Mars in, in our lifetimes. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's very much a long-term, sort of long-scale project, and it's about, you know, as I say, having a backup planet for civilization. So it's not, you know, as much as certain individuals might want to see Mars in their time, it's not really about the individuals, it's about the idea of, you know, preserving the species. If, you know, if a an asteroid hits Earth, or if the sun explodes, or whatever, you want to have a backup planet for humanity, and that's... At the light, turn Mars. left onto Riverside Drive. One of the places you went to was Chernobyl. Um, why did you want to go there? People are not building bunkers in Chernobyl. <laughs> no one wants no. to live on the site of no. a nuclear catastrophe. Well, you know, I wanted to see what the end of the world looked like, in a way. Uh, and I also wanted to see what a kind of an, like a catastrophic event on the order of Chernobyl, what happens afterwards. And I was fascinated by the ways in which life is kind of returning to this place in ways, you know, nature is thriving there and not only nature, but people are living there. There are, they are? You know, a yeah. yeah, there's a relatively small number of people, um, you know, in the dozens, but there are, and you know, generally older people who have returned there to live in their houses that they evacuated um, in the immediate aftermath of the disaster. And so there are people living there. But ultimately, what I was really interested in was, you know, catastrophe tourism. Um, there are tour companies that have set up in and around Kiev who will bring you there and you can stay overnight, which is what I did on the tour. And, uh, you know, you get to explore Pripyat, which is the um, abandoned... In three quarters of a mile, at the roundabout, Take the first exit onto Holmberg and Road. There's a, just, it's, a, it's a fascinating kind of insight into the sort of visual spectacle of the apocalypse. You know, you get to wander around this kind of diorama of a, a sort of post-apocalyptic future. And I think that's what attracts the people who are on this tour and, you know, to some extent, myself. So what does it look like? Um, it's pretty grim. <laughs> uh, you know, it was a beautiful day, the, you know, the two days I was there. So, you know, nature has reclaimed the place. Uh, Pripyat is full of like, you know, nature just bursting forth out of concrete. And uh, there is something sort of quietly beautiful about it. And there's, you know, wolves that has quite a large population of wolves there. Um, so life is kind of going on without humanity. So there's something as bleak as it is, there's something slightly reassuring about that. Um, I wouldn't recommend it as a honeymoon destination. At the roundabout, take the first exit onto Holmberg Road. Um, how much did the tour cost? The tour was, I think it was something around maybe 250 pounds, which is a lot of money in Ukraine. Um, I think it's close to like a, you know, a, a month. In three range. quarters of a mile, it's at the roundabout, take the first exit um, onto Holmberg Road. On the tour um, from Kiev, so you get on the tour bus outside of McDonald's in uh, Maidan Square and it's about a two hour drive to the zone and then you know it's, it's heavily sort of controlled or patrolled by um, the army still at this point so you need a passport to get in and they check your passport and you're sort of rigorously checked for radiation at various points along the way towards the power plant and you know they they bring you around this place and uh, show you what you know what it's what it was like to live in this place and what it's like now um you know it's it's a pretty there are some you know threats of you know pockets of radiation that are quite high but in general the cleanup was very successful and you know the guides know where they're taking you so you don't stray into any particularly um you know hot spot zones or whatever the one thing they do tell you is don't eat the moss i wasn't gonna eat the moss anyway at the roundabout quite, take the first exit onto uh, holmberg I, road sort of, strict about eating anything from the ground particularly moss moss soaks up a lot of radiation so if you do go to chernobyl do not eat the moss so you are 
worried about exposure to radiation on the tour? Um, well, you know, you've read my book, so you know I'm quite a nice person, so I did find ways to be worried. Um, <laughs> You know, mostly after the fact, like I, you know, I got back from the two day tour. In 1.3 miles, turn left onto State Road 7 North. Why was I, you know, what, was it worth it? Um, I'm still, you know, I'm okay. But I think the, um, the thing that you realize pretty quickly is that almost everywhere you go, the levels of radiation are actually lower than they would be. You know, they, they measure the, the radiation with a dosimeter outside McDonald's in uh, the McDonald's in Kiev. And it's um, quite a bit higher than it is in most of the places where you were in the zone. So any kind of built up urban area would probably have higher radiation levels than any of the places where you actually go on the tour in the zone. Now, there are places where you just don't want to be within the zone. Um, the power plant itself, certain spots there are still incredibly high. Um, but you don't go anywhere near those. Well, let's take a short break here and then we'll talk some more. If you're just joining us, my guest is Mark O'Connell. His new book is called Notes from an Apocalypse. We'll be right back. This is Fresh Air. NSU Art Museum Fort Lauderdale brings the museum to you with free virtual tours and educational resources available. An apocalypse about people who are preparing for a doomsday caused by environmental catastrophe, nuclear war, a pandemic, a comet crash any number of things how old are your children though my son just turned seven in 2.6 miles turn right onto west palmetto park road Our daughter is about to turn two how has the virus affected your life as a father it's a really good question i mean we're still in the middle of it so it's hard to have like real perspective on it but you know in a way like our children's lives are very much in the home anyway you know um their sort of sense of the world is is quite small so certainly for her daughter she has no idea anything is going on it's just you know she's at home and her brother's at home and that's great um my son misses his friends and he misses school um and that's starting to become a thing he's not upset about it but it's just you know we're aware of it and when it started to happen first when the lockdown happened first I was basically okay with the day-to-day -day of my own experience and, you know, I was getting through it. But the thing that made me most emotional, the thing that really sort of got to me was the idea that my son would be, you know, possibly quite a bit older when he got to spend time with his friends again. And I would think about, you know, what if they're, you know, how much taller are they going to be? How much older are they going to be? Will they recognize each other? Will they feel strange around each other? Um, and so thinking about those things made me quite emotional. And a sort of amazing thing happened on his birthday, actually. His, um, his little friend who lives across the street, she's a little bit older than him, um, but she dropped over a walkie-talkie in a, in a bag with a birthday card for him. And like every day, more or less, since they've been talking to each other on walkie-talkies. And I think that's like, that, that just makes me feel okay. You know, I feel like they're finding ways to make contact with each other they're finding ways to continue their relationships you know technology helps you know um, and kids are you know pretty resilient and so I'm I'm worried about the long-term future for sure and I don't want this to go on too long no one does um, but I think I think they'll be okay walkie-talkie and not cell phone uh, no walkie-talkies uh, Oddly enough, I mean, he talks to friends on his um, on his mum's and my cell phone as well. They use FaceTime a lot, but they they really get a kick out of the walkie-talkie thing. There's a kind of a just a, a fun aspect to the walkie-talkie that uh, I would not have predicted. It's beautiful to hear them talking to each other. The first time they had a conversation on the walkie-talkie, I was sitting in my room and I could hear him shouting to his friend, saying, "Do you miss Do you miss your friends?" Over, and I just thought like that was the most beautiful, <laughs> hilarious thing, you know, to hear from a a seven-year-old so yeah you, the moments like that you kind of think you know it's sad and it's tough but maybe they'll be okay you know end of the world scenarios now tend to revolve around you know climate catastrophe uh, pandemics um, ideas about like the sun burning out or a comet colliding nuclear war but the end of days goes back to like really early times I, you know there have always been visions as far as we know that say the end of the world is near 
certainly like people in Jesus's time, some people believed it, some people prophesied it. My understanding is that, you know, Jesus believed that the end of days was near. So do you think like we're wired in some way to think about the end of the world, whether it's because of religion or man-made problems or, you know, cosmic interplanetary problems? Yeah, I think I, I think we're not fully conscious or we, you know, we don't fully acknowledge enough how much of our culture and how much of our thinking is informed by religion. I mean, it's absolutely true. Like, you know, Christianity itself, which is, you know, it forms so much of the template of our culture. Christianity began as a kind of an apocalyptic sect of Judaism, you know? Um, Christ believed that the end was near, that, you know, the last days of creation were at hand. And, uh, you know, the apostles were kind of drawn to this idea. And, uh, you know, even St. Paul, you know, the, the idea was that creation was near to an end. And uh, there's a, <clears throat> I quote a line early in the book from St. Augustine, who's writing in, I guess, the fifth century AD. And he's talking about, you know, there was a trend at that time to, and there still is now, of course, in many ways, um, to predict when the end is going to come. And he's, he's writing a letter to um, some bishop or other, and he's saying, you know, it's not for us. In one mile, turn right onto West Palmetto Park Road. You just have to have faith that, you know, it will come. Maybe it will come in our time, maybe it won't. Um, but he's talking about the sort of apocalyptic fervor of those early Christians and their absolute conviction that they were living in the last days of creation. And he says, if those were the last days then, how much more so now? And I just think it's such a beautiful, like ironic, kind of witty, but true statement, you know? Um, Maybe it was the end of the world then, but maybe it really is now, you know? And I think we, you know, almost every generation has some version of that. And, you know, I was writing that at a time when really what was in my mind was climate change, you know? And the prospect of maybe this is the end of civilization as we know it. You know, it wasn't, didn't happen to be the end of civilization as we know it during the Cold War or the Cuban Missile Crisis or whatever, but maybe now it really is. And that, again, seems to sound a kind of an ironic note to me now, given what's happened in between me writing those lines and uh, what's, what's happening now. I, I want to add something about your book, is that it's, it's actually pretty entertaining and that you have a very nice sense of humor um, throughout it uh, and a really interesting voice as a, as a writer. So for anybody interested in it, I, I don't want to make it- At the light, it's turn like right onto West Palmetto Park Road. It's, it's, a, it's a really interesting book um, and kind of like a travelogue through people's, you know, visions of life in, a, in an apocalyptic world but of surviving it, sometimes in luxury. <laughs> so, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, no, and I mean, I hope it is a funny book and, you know- In 2.9 miles, turn left onto Baracus away. And it can often kind of not be apparent that the book is funny. But for me, like I don't actually set out to be funny. It's often the first thing that people say about my work is that it is, you know, funny. But it's not, it's never part of like the concept of what I'm doing or part of my intention, even when I'm writing, when I'm sitting down line by line, is this funny? Can I make this funnier? That's never part of it. For me, I don't see any distinction between absolute seriousness and funniness. For me, like being funny is often just an epiphenomenon in writing of being serious. So, you know, it's often the case that my intention is not, like my intention is to be absolutely serious and the result is funny because for me, like a lot of the world is just, you know, humor is everywhere. You don't have to go looking for it. You don't have to impose it sort of top down. You just, my job as a writer, I feel, is just to describe things as accurately as possible. To be kind of diligent in reporting reality. And reality is often just pretty hilarious. Yes, and so reality is often pretty re uh, hilarious. You have an eye for the absurd. And those two things don't necessarily reduce anxiety. <laughs> No, in fact, sometimes they can increase it. Although, you know, laughter is obviously a kind of a release valve. So, but sometimes, you know, I, I find in my work that like the funny stuff comes as a result of a buildup of like an accumulation of anxiety and seriousness. And, you know, I'm often...